Okay, so uh, I was told to give a lecture, and I don't give lectures. I'm, I'm, I'm not a professor, I'm, I just do research, I have this privilege. Uh, and of course, I was too busy to really prepare a lecture. So I just diluted a lengthy seminar, uh, which means that I don't or rarely go into details, but you're allowed to stop me. I mean, actually, you should stop me whenever you would like to hear more or something wasn't clear or, you know, I jumped too fast, etc. cetera. Um, and that's also, I think, a, a, you know, a series of lectures would have made sense, uh, but it, I decided to cover a longer range of things and results and, you know, just to give you an overview, of course, and articulated, organized overview and um, of what we've been doing around this theme of collective motion over the last 10 years, maybe, you know. That's basically when I started, and uh, more or less. Since then, the field itself, uh, now called active matter by most people, at least in physics, has, has grown incredibly, and uh, it's still in its exponentially, exponential growth phase, I would say. So that's for you later. It's a good idea to work on active matter physics. <laughs> you know, still, it's, it's still a good idea. Uh, it's fashionable. And um, OK, so I haven't done this, what, what follows now, all by myself. And um, here's a, as a partial list of the people I will fail to mention along the <laughs> lecture. OK, uh, and they come from many different countries and many different uh, kind of uh, science. I mean. Uh, People like uh, Guy Terolaz at the bottom here is a French animal behavior specialist. I mean, he calls himself a quantitative social etologist. So he's not a biologist, he's not a physicist, he's uh, formerly in neurosciences, but that's not what he does. So, uh, you know, okay, he survives this uh, fate. Uh, the Japanese uh, gentlemen here, are, are, some of them are really biologists, in fact. Uh, Oiwa-san, Kazuira Oiwa, Nishizaka, uh, you'll see some of their results. Uh, the rest is mostly physicists uh, from statistical physics of various flavor, some names you may know, but uh, okay, they all contributed to these things. And the picture here, there's a pointer somewhere, uh, here. Yes, yes. Uh, this picture is, is uh, I've been showing this as the first slide of my talks for a long time now. I should change it, but it's very nice. It's a flock of starlings. These are uh, birds and their flocks, and they're dancing uh, at the end of the day uh, in many countries, actually in more and more countries. This is also climate change maybe here. Uh, it's been, has become really popular and famous, really spectacular. I'm not, I'm not sure if you've ever seen this. You can easily find a movie on the web. Uh, and okay, so nobody knows why they're doing this. Uh, at the end of the day, they gather in larger and larger and larger groups and they sort of dance, let's say, for you know, half an hour, an hour before settling down on the trees below and making a mess, basically, but for the night. But uh, before doing that, that's quite spectacular. They, 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 this one probably involves several tens of thousands of birds. Uh, they are very close to each other, about a couple wingspan. Uh, they never touch each other, and they react and move very fast at a collective uh, level, I mean, uh, at the scale of all these things. And they are, typically, this is accompanied, of course, by the presence of predat predators, hawks, or whatever, trying to catch one, and they never succeed. They only succeed if one strays out of a group, then they have a serious chance of getting it. So that makes, you know, people, etologists, animal behavior people think. Uh, as a physicist, I'm rather interested, we've been rather interested in how this can be done rather than why it's done, you know. And in fact, the why question nobody knows the answer to. Okay, so that's just a pretty picture. Um, now, I, I decided to, to, I'm sorry, I skipped most of the lectures except the first one on Thursday morning. And Jean-Francois Joanny told you about mostly near equilibrium systems, you know, linear response regime where fluctuation dissipation theorem holds and all the things he's been saying are mostly, uh, con, you know, confined to the regime where you're not so far from equilibrium and you actually can expand and, you know, do linear things. 
Uh, you may argue that most systems we know of in, in life, living systems, are not very near equilibrium. Okay, there are various degrees uh, in there. Um, okay, starting with what I do is statistical physics, and we deal mostly with emergent collective properties, trying to predict, <laughs> understand, predict collective behavior from local interactions. So that's a classical program of statistical physics. Uh, in today, this has become, you know, out of equilibrium, dealing with out of equilibrium systems, meaning we have many less results and hard results in particular, uh, and we deal with systems that are not especially molecules or atoms, but, you know, agents, birds, fish. And the general question is that of given interaction rules, how can I understand predict collective properties? And in, in, in such a general setting, of course, uh, you can think of this in many different fields, not just physics, biology, but also, you know, whatever, economics, uh, robotics, whatever. So one of the strong, important results in equilibrium statistical physics is the notion of universality, uh, typically associated to phase transitions and critical points where a system, you know, uh, goes from one regime to the next, changing, uh, breaking a symmetry. Typically, you have a critical point, often. This critical point and its region around it is characterized by universal properties in the sense that uh, these, the way the correlation functions behave and so on, do not depend on any detail. They just depend on the symmetry of the phases you are going from to, or to from, the dimension of space, and that's basically it. Uh, so that's hardwired in the sense that we have theorems proving this. At the mathematical level, this is best understood within the renormalization group approach, which actually shows you, if you follow the, the RG flow, shows you that most systems which have the same symmetries, etc., etc., when they are at the critical point, or when they go to the critical point, they go exactly to the same critical point in the space of systems as you increase the scale describing it. So the RG flow basically is a flow in scale space, when you go from a microscopic scale that defines your model, to the infinite size scale, which describes the thermodynamic of it. Now, this universality business, uh, I hope most of you have more or less understood what I just said, it carries through to out of equilibrium situations. In fact, it's, it's, um, there's empirical evidence for many, many different uh, phenomena to, uh, first, there is, there is evidence for phase transitions out of equilibrium, okay, uh, which have no counterpart in equilibrium. It's not just an, you know, a non-equilibrium version of some Ising transition, which is possible. Uh, for example, if you go from, you know, one system which has up-down symmetry or left-right or one-two, whatever, some Z2 symmetry, uh, and this symmetry, you know, uh, becomes uh, broken under some tuning some parameter, without any Hamiltonian, just dynamical rules given to you, this is going to be an Ising phase transition. If it's not first order, uh, it's going to be an Ising transition. This Ising critical point, tuning a control parameter in some system defined by dynamical rules, will have the same critical properties, uh, universal functions, uh, exponents, etc., as the equilibrium Ising system. But there are also uh, many cases in which the phase transition you see in some out of equilibrium system is actually has no equilibrium counterpart. You know, uh, one example is uh, directed percolation transition. Uh, so directed percolation, it has it has many different names. That's the name that people have used most. Uh, a simple definition of it is you have in some system, two states, two local states in space competing, okay? One is an active state and one is a dead absorbing state. And the, um, the definition of a problem by its symmetries, it's, it's just that the absorbing state is absorbing, meaning, <laughs> so I have a system, say in 1D, where I have some active regions, some dead regions, some active regions, some dead regions, etc. Okay, that's in space. 
So that's active, that's dead, you see. There are fluctuations here, there are no fluctuations here. Um, the way there could be fluctuations here, the important thing, and the only important thing here, is that you have no fluctuations in the local state here that can bring you up to the active state. So think of something burning something, uh, some flame front propagating in some spa in space. Okay, uh, the, uh, so the, yeah, there the active uh, dead state is the burnt state. Because in out of the burn region, you cannot have the uh, previous state re-emerging. Uh, you can also, percolation here is the fact that uh, if you can look at this now in space and time, okay, what you have is that this is wet, say, let's call it wet instead of active, and this is dry. Now, uh, in space-time, if you built mentally a space-time picture, uh, the wet region can propagate and invade and maybe, uh, so this is wet can invade some dry regions, of course. Uh, a wet region can also uh, dry up in the middle, for example, nucleating the dry state. That's space now, that's time now, okay, dynamical rule. Um, but the dry region here, okay, there's a boundary here again, wet, and then uh, whatever, it's, whatever this does, this dry region here, cannot see the emergence of the, of the nucleation of the wet state in its middle. Okay, that's the definition of an absorbing state. It's a contamination process if you want. It's an, you know, infection process. So, you know, there are many kinds of things you can think of in this general setting. So this, if you say that the uh, propagation rules for uh, uh, the wet state to invade or not invade or recede, which are probabilistic rules you give yourself, the dry state are governed by some probability. Say the probability that the, that the front here moves, invades or not, is given by some parameter p. Now, if p is very large, uh, this will invade deterministically. And of course, after a short time, from initial conditions that do contain uh, at least a bit of wet state, you will end up with fully wet regime, okay? By the way, percolation comes that now if you, if you take this as a, as a second dimension, say y, this is an xy picture and that's just a percolation of the wet state in this two-dimensional space, but it's directed in the sense that uh, you cannot have uh, contamination on the, way, on the way back. Contamination on the way back would mean something like that, for example, and that's not possible as I, that, because that would mean spontaneous sweating here, okay? Anyway, so that, that's for the name percolation. Uh, now, again, as this parameter P for invasion or contamination is tuned from one where it, you have deterministic invasion to zero where everything dies deterministically, uh, there is a transition from the fully wet state asymptotically to the fully dry state asymptotically. Okay, this transition, especially in 1D here, is always a uh, second order type transition accompanied by critical phenomena at the transition point, at the point where uh, you, go from, you go from fully wet to fully dry asymptotically. The way this thing is organized in space and time is, is basically fractal with, you know, power laws and scale-free structures and critical phenomena, basically. That thing as of course no counterpart in equilibrium because the uh, very definition of the absorbing state, meaning there are no fluctuations able to bring you back from the dry to the wet state here, from the absorbing to the active state, uh, is you know, tantamount to saying that uh, detailed balance is broken. So that's a class, a very wide class, which is defined not really by a symmetry in a sense. This is defined by the dynamics in the sense that the absorbing state is an absorbing state. That's it. And no other symmetries are present. Uh, that defines the directed percolation class. There are many, many, many models you can think of that uh, have been shown numerically at least to show the same critical properties. Okay. Hence, universality. 
really in out of equilibrium systems. Now, experimentally, this has been proven very difficult to show in any uh, experimental system. The problem is often that if you think of, you know, fire or forest fires or contamination processes or things like that, they would, to see the critical properties in some reasonable way, you would need very, very large systems, which is not possible. Uh, if you have some microscopic situation, which you think is uh, similar to this, in fact, a uh, little bit of disorder changes the picture. Okay, these are technical issues. But anyway, at the level of models and also at the level of theory, because renormalization re group approaches can also be performed in this kind of setting. Okay, it provided you start from, say, a Langevin equation or something like this, some stochastic equation. You can do out of equilibrium RG, that's very difficult, but it can be done. At, and certainly the setting that is well known in equilibrium remains true in these out of equilibrium sets of problems. You can see the RG flow literally go from many, many models to the same critical point in the space of models, so to speak, at the critical point. Okay, so that's for equilibrium versus out of equilibrium. Uh, we have less results, less hard results, of course, uh, but we still have some tools that we can use. And in particular, there is evidence and also tools to show that universality is there. I'm insisting on this here. It's not very popular in biology, uh, but it's very useful uh, in some sense because it allows you, you know, once you're convinced that there is some degree of universality, at least in the class of models, in the space of models, uh, you might as well study the simplest possible models, at least first. You know, sacrificing a little bit of the particular problem you're looking at, hopefully keeping the essential things that will, be, that will remain at the level of universal properties. So that's my kind of general philosophy uh, to, do, to you know, try to start thinking about complicated problems as you know, flock of birds flying together. I don't want to model birds, you know. Uh, was, I remember when I was giving talks on this early to biologists or ethologists worse, uh, you know, one of them would raise their hand and say, but your birds are never tired. Why do they always fly the constant speed? That's not realistic, you know. Okay, uh, so you, you have to sacrifice a little bit of something or maybe many things, hopefully keep what's essential at least for the order zero properties. Okay, that's, that's kind of what I'm going to do next, all right? Um, so the minimal models to be defined, a minimal is always a subjective uh, term. Editors in journals do not like it. They systematically replace minimal by simple because there's always somebody who will come up with a, what he or she thinks is a more minimal model than yours. So, so, you know, okay. So simple models are quite okay if you're after universal properties. And universal properties are not just phase transitions and critical points. They are also happening, you know, the phases separating the phase transitions, the, re the diverse, different regimes, dynamical regimes of your systems are, have also universal properties in the sense of the correlation functions, how they behave and so on. All right. Uh, and to come back to what I was starting to saying before, there are various ways of being out of equilibrium. In this, uh, for example, directed pair correlation, et cetera, setting, um, you're nowhere near equilibrium. In fact, uh, if you, would, you, could find, you could think of a model in which you, f you take some parameter to zero and you're, you're back to some equilibrium problem, but that would be a singular limit, meaning it's no use to think of uh, having a model which you can bring to equilibrium if this limit is singular, meaning if you take your small parameter to zero, but what you have for any arbitrary small parameter value away from equilibrium is still qualitatively different from equilibrium, uh, that's not very useful. Uh, so there are, you know, these are genuinely out of equilibrium systems in the sense that it's not a system that is maintained out of equilibrium by some gradient of temperature or whatever chemical potential or something. It's not a model, a system that relaxes very, very slowly, so slowly to equilibrium that you can actually think of what's going on during this time as a as a phase, that's a glassy phase, so to speak, glassy systems. And it's certainly not near equilibrium in the sense that uh, even if you were to take the 
going to equilibrium limit, it would, it would never be really near, it would be qualitatively different. I will illustrate this just after this. I mean, the simplest models for collective motion are like this. You could think of them, you can, uh, the one I'm thinking of, we will define soon a Vicek model. Uh, you, you can think of it as, okay, the, bir the birds, the particles move at constant speed, and the interaction is like in some XY magnetic model. If I take the speed to zero, I go to the XY equilibrium problem limit. That's true. But for any non-zero speed, however small, the properties of this model of moving particles are qualitatively different from those of the XY model. So it's a singular limit in that sense. And this system, whatever you think, is always, in some sense, far from equilibrium and never near equilibrium. Okay? Now, uh, when a system is what I call here genuinely out of equilibrium, meaning it's, it cannot be taken continuously to equilibrium, it is not maintained out of equilibrium by some external force or gradient, and it's not relaxing to equilibrium, then I call this genuinely out of equilibrium. So in the bulk, there is some, you know, at the level of the local dynamics, there is something, some ingredient that is clearly breaking detailed balance and something like, like here in the RT percolation, then I call this uh, genuinely out of equilibrium in the bulk. And active matter, as we understand it, is, uh, for some people, is exactly this definition. What maintains the system out of equilibrium is that it is spending energy at the level, at the microscopic level of some units to do something. Now, my definition, that's, that includes all kinds of, if you take this loose definition, that includes all kinds of systems we've been working on in the, uh, you know, 90s, 80s, 90s, and so on, which are these pattern forming out of equilibrium situations, oscillating chemical reactions and so on. Uh, that's one way of thinking of active matter, but active matter for me and most people, in fact, uh, means a little bit, uh, something a little bit more specific. Okay, that's the outline, come back to this later. Uh, <clears throat> it means that the energy is spent locally in the bulk, in some systems, some units, some agents, some birds, some particles, and this energy is spent in particular to displace the unit, so to produce motion, to propel this uh, particle, or this bird, or this agent, okay? Uh, so that's my definition of active matter. And of course you understand immediately uh, that in this context of an out of equilibrium systems of interacting things, uh, spending energy to displace those uh, things, so self-propelled particles or things like that. Uh, collective motion is one of the obvious, most obvious uh, emergent phenomena that you can think of. Okay? Little things move, spending energy, collective properties, could be, in some, in some instances at least, that they just be moved together or not, and how do they do this? So in this setting, you have a single particle which spends energy to move in a more or less persistent <coughs> random walk, okay? Now you put many together, they interact by, you know, some collisions, some alignment interactions, etc and suddenly they all start moving, although fluctuating still, more or less in the same direction. So you have spontaneous uh, symmetry breaking of the rotational symmetry, and the emergence of collective motion, it becomes just, you know, a phase transition. Okay, when you say this to biologists or ethologists, this, they scream, but that's basically uh, from that, this viewpoint that, I, that people have started in statistical physics to think about uh, collective motion uh, at the simplest level again. Uh, so there was something before, that was the outline. The outline, if I ever go to the end, is that uh, I will first, in the next, uh, whatever, 10 minutes, give you some examples of things we have been doing uh, at the experimental level, uh, uh, here and here. Uh, for this, for more general things, here I will uh, and the rest of the talk, uh, and most of the talk, in fact, will be in this minimal setting where uh, collective motion, you know, whatever the system, I reduce it to uh, alignment interaction. So particles move, they spend energy to move. The interaction is some effective alignment between two particles. And you understand that that's kind of a generic way of, getting, of, of being able to produce collective motion. So if two particles meet, 
they sort of align for a while, and then they, they may you know, go away from each other, etc. Uh, when you have many particles, you could think of this in, uh, interacting, this alignment uh, interaction might be enough to compensate, say, the stochastic components in the system and produce uh, not just a bunch of random workers, but a collection of things moving together. Okay, that's the most, probably the minimal, again, to be discussed, setting for collective motion, some alignment interaction. So you have particles that move, spend energy, that's okay, the level zero. And they interact, of course, and the interaction is just some kind of alignment to be defined later. Uh, in competition with noise or temperature or whatever. I don't want to say temperature here because we are, it's just noise in the system, stochastic components, etc. So that competition between local alignment and noise is my general setting where I will spend most of the talk. And you will see that with only this, already you have all kinds of uh, very unexpected uh, emergent phenomena uh, that uh, I will describe soon. But first, uh, early morning Saturday, uh, early, well, early for some. Uh, I've, I've already, you know, here you can think of, at the experimental level, collective motion could be, you know, of course, in, in, in well, real systems in biology, of course, all kinds of things move from animals to motor proteins. Uh, but also nowadays, in particular, in this active uh, physics of active matter kind of setting, uh, all kinds of things have started to become active. So active colloids, you know, microscopic particles functionalize so to as to react under a field and pro, pro move in some space, for example. Uh, swimmers, of course, uh, micro nano swimmers, uh, etc. Uh, in robotics, also there is what is called distributed robotics or swarm robotics, where you want to perform a task not by you know constructing a couple of very fancy, uh, sophisticated, expensive robots, but rather by a crowd of little cheap robots where you can sacrifice a few of them and they will together be able to do something useful. Okay, that's, you could understand easily. And now people like Guy Terolas, we mentioned that uh, they like to use the term swarm intelligence in the context of social insects and so on, where, you know, okay, you take an ant, it's pretty stupid, but if you look at what an ant colony is able to do, it's quite remarkable. So they stress this under the name swarm intelligence. And as a matter of fact, we are all more or less thinking of the same problematic, meaning the emergent phenomena from things that are moving uh, together. Okay. Oh, that's the usual uh, nice slide where you see many different things moving. Okay, and uh, I already said most of this. Here we are, we are talking about, we'll be mostly interested in collective motion and all things that uh, move and produce some interesting collective behavior when there is no external field that tells them where to go or no leader that they follow to go somewhere, which would be kind of a trivial way of having collective motion. It's really the problem of the spontaneous symmetry breaking of a population of more or less identical objects interacting locally, okay? So you have horses, bacteria, birds, fish, granular, metallic particles. I will show this next or soon, okay? And uh, we're looking for collective things. So what, what could you do uh, uh, experimentally? I could say, okay, animals, animals. Okay, so a flock of, you know, a herd of sheep, uh, that's kind of hard to work with, although we've done some work with sheep. Uh, I, will, I will show it a bit. No, I won't show it a bit here, but anyway. Uh, fish, okay, fish, you can put them in the tank. That's what's happening here. Uh, but the tank, you know, is never large enough and the groups are small and it's very hard. They learn, they keep memory of what you've, <laughs> the tricks you've been trying to <laughs> them to do and so on. So it's very hard. Um, not a lot of control on things, even if you're a spe fish specialist, you know. Uh, it's worse with birds where you can, you know, it's hard to have the birds in the lab. Insects, some people manage to put them swarms in the lab and that's uh, actually promising, but I won't speak about it. So here in fish, uh, I tell you a little story uh, because I have an hour and a half I can afford to. Um, it's not a minimal model, you know. It's, it's, it's a case where interactions are more complicated than just aligning and uh, I will show you how we see this, in fact, from data. So we, you know, we know, 
Guy Terolas and friends go to La Réunion, you know, uh, Indian Ocean, tropical weather, where they raise fish for commercial purposes. These fish, of course, are available, that's good. They're pretty big, they're about 30 centimeters. Uh, and they put them in a tank which is four meter diameter and the uh, depth is, I don't remember, 20 centimeters or something like this. So it's, it's a quasi 2D system flat. They can pass below each other, but that's a rare event. It's mostly a two dimensional motion. Okay. And they put, you know, one, two, three, five, <coughs> ten, fifteen, up to thirty fish in this thing. And they film and this they do this for, you know, each group size they do, I don't know, ten replicas maybe or five, I don't remember. And they filmed these things after some transient uh, time uh, for a few minutes only. So that's actually, that was, the data was taken long ago, more than 10 years ago, and it's been sitting there. It's not much data nowadays. We would get, you know, hours of this, possibly. Uh, but anyway, even with this little data, um, we could get to some interesting stories. Now, this fish is well behaved. It first, for modeling purposes, it, it, sm it swims at constant, fairly constant uh, speed. That's good. So, you know, it's like a self-propelled particle at constant speed. There are fluctuations in the tangential in the speed, but these are small, smallish, and they are not correlated to the important variable, which is the angular speed. So it, it, it moves at constant speed. Of course, the, the, the trajectory is smooth and, you know, differentiable, etc., because it's a big fish and it never stops. You know, it's not, it's not a random walk subjected to noise on the orientation. So there is a stochastic component. If I, if I, I draw you the trajectory, how do you do random walk, which is, all, is everywhere smooth? You do something like this, uh, okay, whatever. So at large scales, this is going to remain a diffusive process. At small scales, this is you know, nowhere like what you're used to as a random walk where you have you know, all kinds of, almost everywhere, angular points here. Uh, so that's one observation, easy. So, and, in, and indeed, data with one fish uh, uh, show this, show that this is very well modeled by uh, so the only important variable here is the angular speed, okay, angular velocity, sorry. Uh, yeah, they're supposed to move, yeah. Let's keep you, keep, keep you busy while my, while my talking. But basically, the, the one fish motion is well modeled by this einstein ullenbeck process. That's the angular velocity, okay. It relaxes to zero over time scale tau, okay. And when tau is very large, that's basically the time for the persistence of a curvature. If tau is very large, you're going to have a fish going in pseudo circles for a long time before inversing polarity. And it, uh, it relaxes to a target uh, value, which here is zero if it's one fish only in some infinite space. This could be modulated by the wall. I don't want to speak about this. And here's a random number here. So Gaussian, you know, Wiener process of amplitude sigma. This is the einstein nullenbeck process. If you look at, so that's for the, uh, again, uh, variable, which is the angular velocity. If you reconstruct the trajectory from just this, reconstruct trajectories which are uh, quanti quantitatively indistinguishable from the actual trajectories of one fish. Okay, you can actually estimate tau and sigma and the fact that it is a Gaussian effective noise here from the experimental data, okay? So I have my constant speed particle with stochastic components in the walk, etc. Now what we, so here's we have data here on, on, with two fish and five fish. Sorry, come on. Mm -hmm. Yes, come with me. No, it doesn't want to go. Anyway, yes, yes, thank you. Um, and of course, you know, the movies look the same and you can't tell which one is which, etc. Uh, we go a little bit further than that. We are able, uh, <clears throat> from the data on two fish, for example, 
to, uh, to show that a, a reasonable model based on minimality assumptions and starting from the normal model, which is just this one, just one fish, to say that there are two contributions to the interaction between two fishes. This is this um, positional interaction which says if one fish is too far away from the other, uh, it goes towards it. So that's some kind of attraction. Okay? And this one is an alignment term. Uh, these quantities are defined here, which tends to align the two headings of a fish. And what we discovered experimentally from data analysis is that the coefficients here, in fact, or this coefficient here is proportional, the strength of this interaction is proportional to the distance between fish, at least within the range of distances available in the experiment. And this one uh, is proportional to the speed of, uh, of uh, fish. First, when you put two fish or three fish or five fish, they synchronize their speed. But from experiment to experiment, they have different group speed that changes. So, so you have collective motion of two fish. Yeah. Well, we, we start with two, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but then, given your, your experiments and probably your, your theoretical setting, they can't be apart for too long, for too far. Yeah, no. The, the, the what I didn't say about the one fish experiment that we also model quantitatively with some statistical tests, etc., and extract from, from the data the, uh, the type, the nature of the interaction with the wall. So the first, the first thing is that we are able to model quantitatively extracting all parameters and checking on all kinds of statistical quantifiers, uh, the one fish in a tank. Okay, now the question is, now I have two fish, we built up from this, you know, we don't want to go Okay, I give you a movie with 30 fish in a tank and you try to guess the local rules. That's very hard, in fact. Because at, at the collective level, many uh, models do the same thing. And this is true for any pair of fish? Uh, this, is a you know, this is for this species of fish, uh, this adult, the, the adult fish. It's probably reasonably, a kind of the, the general framework that we have built is probably valid for Speech, fish species in which the fish moves at constant speed. Uh, many little fish, they, they swim by bursts. That's very different, actually working on this now. But anyway, the philosophy here is that we try to infer interaction rules from data. That's hard. That's not that, you know. Uh, so for two fish, we have this, we come up with this. It's a long story, I'm making it short, but basically what we have here is that uh, the two, two, in, two dominating interactions are or two, the two we can actually record experimentally or find experimentally are attraction when the two fish are far from each other because when, the, when this becomes large, this dominates this and vice versa when this is small, this dominates this and this is just uh, a sign meaning of the angle between the two headings of a fish meaning that they tend to go together aligned with each other basically. Yes? It is, uh, the way we do it from data is the center of mass uh, trajectory. We use the center of mass trajectory because otherwise, and we filter from, for tail beating. Uh, and um, is your, so what you call the angular velocity, is it the curvature of the center of mass trajectory? Yes, yes, yes. Well, there are two ways of doing it, but they're not, you can do it purely from spatial trajectory, assuming constant speed, which it is, but it's not really. Or you can really look at the uh, true uh, trajectory with time and, and taking into account the small variations of speed to define your angular velocity. Uh, there's no difference. The, thing, the important thing is that there is no strong uh, discernible correlation between the fluctuations of speed and the changes in the angular velocity. You see, so you can basically decorrelate the, the two things and that's why it works. In fact, if you have a model where generically you would expect that the two things are actually correlated and when it turns fast, it has to slow down first, which happens if, if it really turns fast, but which, you know, these fish are really easy going. Uh, but otherwise, then you would have a model which, on which you cannot just reduce the dynamics to the angular velocity, and of course, it's much more complicated. 
That's why I'm showing this simple example. Yes? This model, you're taking the velocity of one fish uh, to a constant. Yeah. Yes, what we see, uh, we take, uh, what's observed is that when you put uh, several fish together, they synchronize their speed, their average speed. Each of them fluctuates to 10, 20 percent instantaneous values. To, okay. But they synchronize their speed. But if you take two fish, do one experiment, take two other fish, do the same experiment, the, the, the group speed or the pair speed will be different from experiment to experiment. That's why we can actually detect how these parameters depend on the speed. But that's the group speed. Okay, we put this in a model, of course. When we, the model is that, okay, for a certain size, uh, for a certain group, <coughs> we have a model which, in fact, is depending on the speed. And the properties, emerging properties, emergent properties of a model depend on this parameter, which we have no control of, and we can say, okay. But this, we rec this variation here, as well as this term here, which have, you know, that's the wall interaction, this we can quantify and extract from the data on the, at the you know, we try this, we try a little bit complicated, more complicated, complex models. If you add more terms, we have no statistical reason to adopt them, so we give them, we, and, and that's, so the minimum level of what we have to consider for the amount of data we have boils down to that sort of, uh, that sort of model. And it works really well. Uh, now, more than two fish, of course, is important. And the uh, um, first question is, do you have many body interactions? And most physicists m making models, they first implicitly, in fact, assume that all interactions are pairwise. Uh, now, there is some data on some other fish which shows that that's not true. Uh, there is a significant component of the uh, statistics of interactions between free fish, for example, which shows that there are free body interactions which are important. So you cannot decompose free fish behavior generically into two pairs. Uh, here we check that. It, in this case, it works really well. Uh, you can, for five fish, for example, uh, you assume that uh, the correlation, the interaction is uh, pairwise. So we have a pair interaction already extracted from two fish behavior. Uh, we do it for five fish, supposing that each fish is interacting with its four neighbors. With the interaction, we found at the level of two fish, okay? Now the question is how to normalize these things. These are not forces, you know, really, not physical forces. In fact, you have, we have to, uh, I think maybe it's on the next slide or maybe not. There's no next slide, that was really short. Uh, the way we do it is that we do see that pairwise decomposition is valid quantitatively from the data. So we, we don't have to worry about many body interactions for this fish. Uh, but we, the sum of the pair interactions with all the neighbors has to be normalized by the number of neighbors to, to remain quantitatively valid. And we do see that the pair, the interactions determined for two fish with its quantitative values here of the two free parameters we have here, we, use, we can use the same interaction and the same quantitative parameters extracting from experiments to describe the behavior of, say, five fish here as a sum of pairs, normalized by a number of pairs. So that's okay when we have a small group and all fish interacts with each other, sort of global coupling, you know. But if you have 30 fish or more than, more than five, etc., you have, it's not true that a fish uh, interacts with all the fish pairwise. In fact, what we find is that it interacts, the best way to describe the data is to say that it in, interacts with a more or less constant number of neighbors, these neighbors are defined by some Voronoi tessellation, some non-metric thing. The Voronoi tessellation, if you know what it is, good. If you don't know what it is, this is a geometrical construction here in 2D between points, which uh, allows you to build a polygon around each point in space. And of course, a number of neighbors defining the surrounding polygons. These are Voronoi neighbors. This construction does not, does not depend on some metric interaction range. It's not that the fish stops interacting between, you know, after 1.5 meters or up to one meter it aligns and after between one and three meters it attracts or whatever. No, no, here we have something that is not depending on any metric zone and is, is, is given by this. Uh, so at least this way of having non-metric neighbors works quantitatively well again with the data. That's all. Okay, uh, the data we have, 
uh, does not allow us to distinguish, uh, to say clearly that we should take into account the fact that fish behind, you perceive them or you react to them less. Uh, some other data, of course, show this. We have introduced an angular factor in, in these things, which, uh, frankly, for the little data we have, does not make a difference, but is, is a reasonable thing to do. So anyway, so here we build from one fish, two fish, small group where you decompose in pair, and then many fish where we have to find the best possible neighborhood from the data. And we conclude that the Voronoi neighborhood is pretty good for this amount of data we have, because, yes? So here, there's no avoidance. Um, in principle, it should be if you were to build a 3D model. If you look in the, in the movies, I'm not sure you see that, they can pass through each other in the data. Sometimes, not maybe in five fish, some, yeah, you see more or less. I mean, does, does the fish align to another fish like it would align to the wall? Uh, not quite. The, um, this uh, war interaction term here is governed by the time, the time, this thing here is the time the fish eye, given its current orientation, will take at, at its constant speed, of course, to hit the wall. That modulates the intensity of this. And there is no explicit repulsion between fish here, uh, again, for simplicity, uh, also because experimentally they do pass through each other, so to speak, below each other, above each other. Rarely, but they do. In fact, in the model, there are, no, there are not many more, you know, crossing of fish through each other, so to speak, than there are in the data. Okay, I'm spending too much time on this, but that's... So that's, in my opinion, not just because I participated into this, that's one of the best examples when you, you have controlled, you try to do control experiments with, with you know, animals, and you try to infer quantitative interaction rules, behavior, from the data. And that's helped here because this fish is really well behaved and this constant speed thing helps a lot. Uh, if, you, if you go to other animals, like, okay, like fish, no fish, sheep. <sighs> no control, very hard to control anything. You are, you're tempted to describe this as some kind of fish, sheep, fluid, whatever. If you, look if you look carefully here, most of them are walking, but some of them stop. It's like a two-phase fluid, you know, and then, and, uh, okay. It's tempting, but there's no way you can do experiments on any serious uh, scale with enough control on animals. Okay, so what next you can do, you can do bacteria. Bacteria, uh, you may think that People know uh, what bacteria are doing, but of course there are all kinds of interactions that we don't know of, and uh, etc. Still, there are some. There is more control, and here you see some Japanese bacteria forming after the, col the colony growing on a, on a single layer, monolayer. Okay, that's Flavobacterium. For those who know that bac bacteria, uh, that's time in minutes, uh, also in minutes here. This is about. 500 microns, I think. And so they spontaneously form vortices. They all rotate in the same direction. These vortices can be millimeter size. Um, and the biologists tell us that, you know, it's only local contacts. Okay, we have to believe them. Uh, it's not quite as close packed. You don't see very well here, but almost. And uh, it's coarsening to very, very large vortices, etc. So that's one presumably a reasonably good case for bacterial collective spectacular motion that we are working on. But again, all kinds of things are certainly going on in this system that we have no control of. It's just to show you that. Nevertheless, we're trying to do models. Uh, we have data on single bacterial motion and all these things, but that's, okay, too complicated. All this is too complicated. It's nice, but it's too complicated. So we first, we, so we'll go back to minimal models or minimal experiments in which, in fact, you reduce everything to alignment versus noise. So, alignment versus noise, yes, okay. Minimal setting for collective motion. Uh, that's what Vicek, uh, Tamas Vicek and collaborators in 1995 did. 
that's the birth of this business in physics at least. And what, what he did is a typical statistical physics approach. Uh, collective motion is very nice, so emergent properties. They were thinking of bacteria actually, but it's too complicated. So why, just look, why not just look at point particles moving at constant speed and they align their velocities. The speed is constant again and the velocity is uh, the only dynamical variable. They align their velocities locally within distance one. Okay, and that's in competition with noise, which breaks or doesn't break or tries to break this alignment. So that's what Vikshek did, and we'll see this in a, in, in a moment. Now, this is arguably the simple setting for collective motion. It has some uh, direct experimental relevance. Uh, of course, here, you know, thinking of real systems, collective motion, you neglect everything else. You neglect attraction, repulsion, you neglect the fluid, you neglect. Uh, okay, it's, it's overdamped dynamics typically, and so you neglect inertial effects, you neglect all kinds of things. And you don't conserve momentum, that's very important here. You align, when you align particles at constant speed, you break momentum conservation, which is okay for particles moving on a substrate like me now, or bacteria crawling, etc. and not so okay with um, bacteria swimming, where you do have to consider the fluid. But anyway, in some instances, uh, you can just align by inelastic collisions and you, momentum is not conserved. You, so you compare to ordinary equilibrium or ordinary fluid, you, you have less symmetries, less conservation laws, and the equations to describe this fluid at large scales are certainly going to be more complicated. Okay, but so this, just to tell you that we have a very simple uh, setting now, just alignment, local alignment versus noise. But this, still this experimentally is, is, can be uh, relevant. For example, in, in context of shaken granular particles where you have more control of what's going on. So you have inelastic collisions between these. So you shake vertically some you know, millimeter size particles. On the left here, you have particles which are symmetric head tail. So they're just elongated little rods. It's an active pneumatic system in which under shaking, one given object can move preferentially uh, along its axis, but also back. So it's very anisotropic diffusion, but not really collective motion as a, as a polar particle. On this side here, these are little particles, color coded by the computer, but little particles which actually have a built-in not only axis, but an oriented axis. So they move under shaking. They move spontaneously forward persistently, very persistently. Uh, uh, with a persistence length which is larger than the dish size here. So these are really polar particles and they move together. So here in the pneumatic case, you immediately see if you have some education in equilibrium pneumatics, you see here a defect, okay? This defect moves uh, fairly ballistically at constant speed. And that's certainly not possible in equilibrium pneumatics. Because the motion of this defect is the uh, experimental signature of the active VT in the system. And people have been looking at this. Uh, in, in, and this is fairly well defined by models in which you have to have little rods with inelastic collisions. These rods are activated in the sense that they are forced to move preferentially along their axis, this back and forth. And uh, that's enough to actually account for this and defect motion and all this. And the polar. Yeah, well, the problem is here that uh, the energy input and the noise, so to speak, are sort of entangled in a way that we cannot. There is control experimentally, but this control does not, ab does not allow us to disentangle between the energy supply and the noise strength, so to speak. So in models of this, uh, you have this problem that indeed, uh, you have, to mod you have only one way of one control parameter, typically, or you have two. You have the amplitude and the frequency, but typically we don't touch the frequency because of want to avoid resonances and stuff like that. So one main control parameter, which 
accounts for varying the energy input and some kind also influences the noise level. And the noise in the collisions and noise from the collisions with the top and bottom. Uh, so there is control but still complicated. In fact, you can do 3D Newton law simulations of that sort of things nowadays and uh, qualitatively reproducing what you see in the experiments. But, uh, okay. So here to show you a nice movie. Again, color coded by the computer. This is a real system of shaken little circular particles, but with two asymmetric legs. Okay. Now, in these systems, in fact, uh, we can show quantitatively again from data analysis that they are close to uh, well described by essentially effective alignment and noise, of course. Another type of system that I will spend a few minutes on. Um, but I see the time is running, uh, is motility assay, so closer to biology, where we do in vitro experiments with molecular motors, molecular proteins, and biofilaments, here microtubules, and dynein motors. The dynains are uh, attached to a substrate here, a membrane on the substrate. <clears throat> the active heads are sticking out, so that's a carpet with the active heads above. Okay, many, many, many of them, very dense carpet, very comfortable. And on, in, in the presence of ATP, these motors bind to the uh, microtubules above, if any, and push them. Uh, if you have a very dense uh, assay of carpet of motors, this motion of one microtubule is again very smooth, pretty much like the fish I described. In fact, quantitatively, you can also describe them pretty well with uh, this Ornstein Nuremberg process. And the interactions between two microtubules when they meet, so you have this microtubule, which is 10 micron long, moving in this uh, very smooth manner, reputation like motion, with some persistence length, you know, the so same trajectories, more or less, I'm in, but the microtubule would be this size, okay, very typically, much smaller than the typical curvature. It's not, it's not a bent microtubules, okay? Uh, so the walk of one microtubule is reduced to this persistent turning walker thing. The interactions which are sketched here are when two microtubules meet, 90% of the time they actually bump into each other physically, and the one hitting the other aligns with the other one. So say here, number two is going to hit one in its middle more or less, and it, squish, it squeezes on it, aligns completely, and they continue together for a while before fluctuation separate them. If the angle is more than pi over two, same thing happens, but it's just anti-aligned. We call this pneumatic alignment. That's some kind of alignment. If the, if the incoming angle is larger than pi over two, you anti-align, okay? And that's the main clearly dominating interaction in this system, even though all kinds of other things are going on. So this system is actually quantitatively fairly well described by a model in which you have constant speed particles with this einstein ullenbeck uh, thing local pneumatic alignment, like here, and uh, that's it. And that, that's a kind of, a, and it works quantitatively to reproduce, okay, the main thing here. After, if you put now many microtubules on this very dense carpet of motors, this is a, the whole experiment, this is some, this is a millimeter or two millimeters, I don't remember, yeah, maybe one millimeter. Many vortices here you see in fluorescence form after 20 some minutes, these vortices about 400, 500 microns diameter. So again, the microtubule is 10 micrometers, the vortices are 400 diameter. Right? So emerging properties like this, after some time, you see that streams are forming and then vortices and so on. Uh, here's a close up here of what's going on. You could see individual if you have, that's not a very good movie, but you can see that else it's actually the corner of two vortices and there is circulation in both directions. So it's locally, it's pneumatic order, 50-50 this way or that way, okay, which you would expect from pneumatic alignment, except that it has formed this global structure here. Now, if you take a model, you have point particles, constant speed, this einstein ullenbeck process acting on the angular velocity and pneumatic alignment, high enough density of particles uh, or low enough noise, well, basically large enough density and, uh, yeah, and the typical relaxation time of the uh, einstein process is large enough, you will 
see those uh, point particles forming vortices like this. And quantitatively, it works uh, reasonably well, even. So that's a model which is not a microscopic model in terms of we describe each molecule, each motor, each protein here. We take a microtubule as a point particle, and we are able to tell you what's going on with millions of microtubules, which is the case in this experiment, fairly quantitatively. OK, but now I really start after one hour. <laughs> And I will show you uh, what we do with silly models for uh, collective motion in, in, in the sense that we here we only have alignment, point particles, alignment, and noise competing with that. So again, constant p speed point particles move. There's no lattice here. Uh, they align with everybody within distance one. If it's a polar particle, a little vector moving like this, you have or you do not have neighbors. If you do have neighbors, you calculate on your neighborhood the mean orientation of, your, of the other, of all the particles, including yourself. And this defines this local mean of orientation is your new uh, direction of motion. You do this at time steps in the computer. Uh, and once you have calculated this local mean orientation, it is in competition with noise, so you add a random angle to this. So that's the dynamical rule that Vicek at collaborators defined in 1995, which is the basic rule for all these simple models. We are just alignment in some local neighborhood and noise. Noise, can you, you can put in different ways. It doesn't really matter. I'm not showing any equations here because what I'm saying does not depend on the way you do this. It does not depend on the shape of a neighborhood. does not depend on whether the speed is really constant or not. does not depend on, uh, you know, nothing, basically. The way you you describe noise or put noise. And there are two main parameters. There are uh, the global density, which is conserved. Particles do not die or, 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 you know, not created and do not die. So constant density, global density is conserved. And the noise strength. At large noise, uh, alignment interaction is washed out. So it's basically, basically random walking like particles, no collective motion. At low enough noise or large enough density, uh, the local alignment from place to place, from interaction to interaction, is preserved. And you have global alignment that can arise in the system. So basically, you expect naively a, a basic parameter space in which you have density here, okay, global density, eh? and uh, noise strength here. Okay, so and there is a line like this, where at large noise it's disordered, and at uh, low noise, large enough density, it's ordered, or collective motion, whatever you want to call it. Collective motion, or some kind of order in the way particles are arranged with each other. That's a naive view, sort of mean field view, etc. And it's uh, indeed. Okay, I will describe various case letters. So why do we do these silly models? You know, I already said most of this. We want to study the simplest possible cases first to understand uh, what's going on, because if you do anything more complicated, you better understand the simplest ingredients. Um, these are also simple models, simple enough that we can build systematically continuous theories to describe them. Whereas if you start from a complicated microscopic particle-based models, it's very hard to do in general. And uh, yes, OK. So let me, I will, this, I realize this may not be the right order, so I'll skip this. I'll come back to this later. What you see naively, uh, and what's what Vicek claimed in 1995, is that at, you know, at low density, basically you have a bunch of, that's a snapshot. You see little arrows. If you have a good eye, they're all disordered. At high enough density or <laughs> sorry, uh, low noise also, uh, this uh, collection of particles here with periodic boundary conditions take more or less the same direction, uh, large density fluctuations, etc., as expected. In fact, what you see when you increase density or decrease noise, <coughs> what you see is that you see configurations like this fairly easily. 
in which spontaneously all the particles have formed this high density, high order band which is moving ballistically in the system at more or less the speed of individual particles. Actually, it could be faster than the speed of individual particles. Uh, and leaving outside, so low density disordered medium. Okay. So, let's uh, go back. Uh, for all these Vickshack like models, wherever the particles are polar or the particles are just active rods, so we have, they have an axis but just a director, not, not an oriented axis, and they are forced, activity forces them to move at constant speed in one of the two possible directions along their axis. That's active pneumatics. Or you do polar particle, like in the original Vickshack model, you have little vectors aligning, etc. In all these models, what we see after many uh, <coughs> years of work and controversies is that in this basic parameter plane here, where you have density, global density, and variance of noise, you see, okay, microscopic disorder, some kind of gas here. Here, some kind of ordered or quasi-ordered in case of pneumatic liquid, meaning the particles exchange positions that they have orientational order, okay? But in between, you have what we now call the phase separated or coexistence phase, where you have spontaneous formation of dense local regions um, leaving outside the gas, basically. Okay? Now, uh, in, uh, so you, you, it's not always one band. If the system is large enough, you have a number of bands which are more or less equally spaced. In fact, we know now that they are really equally spaced asymptotically if you wait long enough. That's a movie where you, it's already after some time here, some bands have formed, but it's kind of irregular in this space. That you see here is a, not every particle but coarse grain density field, okay? We have about a million particles here. And after, on very long time scales, so each frame of a movie is separated by 10,000 time steps, meaning in between each frame, every single particle has moved several times around the box. Uh, anyway, so on very long time scales, you will see that you will see that these things regularize themselves. Okay. So it's not really a movie, it's just, there's some stroboscopic effects here because every frame is separated by so many time steps but they have regularized themselves into a fairly periodic array of bands, so a smectic arrangement of these dense objects. So that's, yes, yes, two, three, four. <laughs> so in this model, there, there's, there's a ferromagnetic interaction. Yes, right? yes. Yes, yes. Um, you, have, you have read some things. <laughs> okay. Uh, this coexistence phase, these things, the coexistence phase here, okay. You see here I'm putting this in the liquid gas language now, not the order disorder magnetism kind of language. The X, you know. The Vickshack model is some kind of XY model in which the spins are not fixed at the nodes of a lattice or whatever, but are forced to move. Okay, so we called this dynamical XY model. So, and everybody focused on order disorder, okay, thinking of differences with XY. There are many differences with XY, I'll come to this next, but in fact, there are even more differences with XY because of this uh, coexistence phase here. If you take neighbors which are Voronoi and not metric, distance one, so Voronoi, I briefly described what it is, this thing disappears completely, and you have an order-disorder continuous phase transition with non-trivial exponents, in the Vickshack case at least. Uh, that, and we sort of understand this now at the theoretical level, if I ever get to this, but <laughs> anyway, yes, you're right. Uh, the reason is, in these models with metric interactions, um, you, the, the denser you are locally, suppose you have a dense packet locally, it's going to be very ordered. If it's very ordered, it's going to move more coherently longer and recruit more guys as it moves. So there's a feedback, positive feedback loop between local density and local order. That you could understand just by words, is going to facilitate the emergence of dense ordered 
regions uh, out and leaving outside not so dense disordered gas. So that's the basic local mechanisms. And if you believe me so far, now you can imagine that if I take neighbors uh, Voronoi style, the, I always have the same number of neighbors. So there's no correlation between local order and local density because local density is uncoupled, decoupled from the local ordering process. And this translates, in a, at the theoretical level of continuous uh, theories, this translates into uh, some dependence of some transport coefficient on the local density or not in the topological case, which shows, and this local, density, this local dependence of a coefficient is at the root of this basic instability of the homogeneous uh, state, which means that you have a strong, you have a local fluctuation of density it's going to be denser and denser and more and more ordered until, you, of course, nonlinear effects will saturate this, but uh, yes. Okay, so for birds, which are argued, or fish, or whatever, pedestrians, argued to uh, have mostly decided about uh, their neighbors or pay attention to guys defined more or less metrically, metric-free, topologically, so to speak, uh, this phase separation thing should not be seen and in fact, it's very hard to see in any system, but it's, it's very generic. There are some evidence of this in some systems, but we don't expect this to be seen in birds or fish or things like that. Yeah. So when I imagine that I see some kind of density wave in the flock of birds, mm -hmm. it's not the same thing. That's, that's uh, basically flocks of birds, at least the starlings, <coughs> they are very, very ordered. You know, the, the order parameter, which is the, uh, the mean velocity, so you, you add up all the local velocities, and of course, if it's disordered, this is going to be zero. If it's ordered, properly normalized, it should be perfectly ordered, it should be one. Flocks of bird starlings are at like 0.97. Very, very, very ordered. And they are very, 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 uh, those which have been studied in 3D, uh, up to a few thousand individuals. So it's not the very large ones that I've shown you. Those are really, uh, fairly homogeneous density. In fact, um, they are like this. They are like, uh, they are like pancakes. So if you have a cross section is typically like this. That's a flock. It's moving typically this way with some typical angle actually here. And uh, it has a thickness of whatever, six or seven bird layers, more or less and contains maybe a few thousand. Okay, so the problem is that, of course, near the boundaries, density might be different, but basically there are very few. There's no space for density fluctuations here. So maybe on, you know, a million birds, <laughs> which of course nobody can see or even or, or study, uh, you, you, you would see significant density fluctuations and we might be able to conclude. But anyway, for all practical purposes, these are very ordered very homogeneous, et cetera. If they are very ordered, there's, if you want to take that the Vicek model is some you know, phase value, they should be somewhere here, you know, sort of a medium density, very, very low noise. So they are far away from the coexistence region anyway. And they're never near the critical point. So this coexistence region, which is like liquid gas scenario with two first order transitions here and here, in the presence of, top with topological neighbors, this boils down to just one critical line with critical properties. But that's not where the birds are, the birds we know of. Uh, okay, good question. There was our other questions, but uh, I skip them unless you scream. Okay, so what's really has been uh, well understood and well, uh, well, not so well understood in fact, but uh, well docu documented and heavily discussed is that this is the now cross section of a configuration with whatever seven bands here moving this way. You see there's some irregularities and so on. Uh, this is a cross section, the same system, same sort of cross section in the ordered phase here without the bands. The bands are in the, in the middle region here, okay. Uh, the order parameter, the order profile in red is very near one, so that's similar to birds. And there are very small fluctuations. The red 
profile here. That's the profile of the degree of order in transversely to motion. Okay, the density profile in black you see has very very strong fluctuations. So these ordered phases here, ordered collectively moving active phases are all of them either, either nematic or polar like here. They all, they all have very strong number flu density fluctuations, anomalously strong number fl density fluctuations as shown here where you see a, the variance of the number of particles contained in a box, in a small box in which you have, in a big system, in which you have on average n particles, that's a variance. Yeah? You see that this, if you, if you had normal equilibrium, uh, law of large number like fluctuations, this would go, the variance would go like n. In these systems in 2D, it goes like n to the power 1.6, something like this. Uh, so much stronger than the normal fluctuations. You have anomalously strong giant number of fluctuations in these things. You also have other strong features like uh, long-range correlations. In fact, if you follow two birds, two particles, and you look at, or, it's just, or even one, in fact, you follow one particle, that's not the way we do it, but if you, can, you follow one particle, uh, or you, and you look at how particles move with respect to each other in this moving fluid, in fact, uh, even in the frame of a center of mass, you're moving the mean motion, you will see that particles actually have a super diffusive motion in the dimensions transverse to the mean motion. So I'm moving, say the flock moves this way, okay, I move the center of mass, but transversely to me, if I look at what particles are doing, they have super diffusive motion with some non-trivial exponent, four thirds actually in, in 2D, which is more or less well seen uh, experimentally or numerically, also experimentally. Uh, and that's the signature of long-range correlations in these phases. So this active, orientationally ordered active fluid phase has strong number fluctuations and has uh, long-range correlations, superdiffusion, etc. This is very generic, does not depend on any of the details of the model, etc. As long as you're away from this coexistence phase. Okay? Now, this is to tell you better that this is really like liquid gas. Now, if I, if I work at constant noise and I increase density, I see that, in fact, what I have is that I have a well-defined basic gas level and the way the, pro the way the system resolves the extra density compared to this gas level is to create a number of these bands and these bands are the same object. That's what is said here. This is two traces at different densities where you see that the baseline, which is the gas density here, is the same and, this, and the individual objects are, are the same also. Meaning, if I work this way, inside the coexistence region here, I first see here, at a given fin finite size, I will see one band, then two, three, four, etc. And here, I will go to the limit where my system is fully covered by bands, so to speak. Not quite, in fact, but anyway. So, it's really the liquid gas scenario in which the liquid fraction, the liquid is organized in some smectic pattern. Yes? So, uh, this is fairly crazy, but uh, are you going to explain the, the band? I mean, why it's not the big uh, chunk of order? Yes, I can explain. Oh, I guess, you know, if I can, I'm sure I'm, uh, I don't know how much time I have. I'm going to skip a few things if, uh, to get to, yes, what we can. So this is numerics. It's fairly clean and very convincing. We do see the same object. We see more and more of them as we increase the density or the size, whatever, etc. It's like liquid phase scenario with first order transition. And no critical point because the liquid has a different symmetry than the gas. The liquid is oriented, is ordered, etc. <clears throat> but at the level of continuous theories, I have interesting story to continue saying. And that's where you see that the generic solution is a periodic solution of bands and not a single packet. But what is the intuitive explanation? The intuitive explanation is that, well, <laughs> the, the, the number fluctuations in the liquid are always strong enough to break a single packet. That's the intuitive explanation we have. Now, uh, 
Yeah, I, if I come to the end of my talk, which is, looks unlikely now, I will I'll be able to convince you. But anyway, we can discuss a bit later. I skip. I will skip the active, the active pneumatics. So basically, the same thing, except the particles align pneumatically, like the microtubules, and they are forced to move along their axis, but they jiggle back and forth. Okay. Uh, same general picture, except that uh, so dense noise strength, density, gas. We here you have quasi long range order act pneumatic global pneumatic order here, like in the XY model. In between, you have this uh, purple phase, which is this inhomogeneous phase where you have high density, high pneumatic order bands. So along the band, the particles travel back and forth, high density, uh, leaving outside some low density disordered gas. This phase, in fact, this coexistence phase in the pneumatic case is chaotic. These things move, etc. So you have a usual scenario, gas, quasi-ordered pneumatic uh, phase here, in between coexistence phase, but this coexistence phase is chaotic in the sense that we can also show more clearly uh, in, oops, in the, in uh, theory. Now, I will, I don't know how much time I have, nothing, something? D minute, 10 minutes. In 10 minutes, I'm going to skip I'm going to say something simple now, and then I'll skip the way we derive theories. Uh, now, this is all numerics, and you can always say that. And it took us a long time to get to that sort of satisfactory picture, and that involved back and forth uh, interactions with the theoretical results. Uh, Vic Schek in 95 was happy to just, you know, look at a smallish model, and he had what looked like a continuous phase transition, and that was fine. Then theoretical arguments and so on uh, showed us that this cannot be and, uh, and there is in between the coexistence phase. Now, to go beyond numerics anyway, you need, however good or clever or well done, you need to go to continuous theories. And there are two ways of doing this for describing that sort of simple systems. You can either write down a theory by, because you're a highly educated physicist by you know, using symmetry arguments in some kind of expansion, gradient expansion of important hydrodynamic fields. So here, density is conserved, so certainly density is an important field, and you see that some kind of very compressible fluids and the coupling between order and density is crucial. Okay? And of course, an orientational field, or velocity field, you know, it's the same thing here, because the, what we're thinking of at least is particles which have more or less constant speed, so velocity or polarity, it's the same, okay? So that's what uh, John Turner and Urai too did in 95 also, after listening to Vic Schek, in fact. They said, okay, let's think about this fluid. It does not conserve momentum. It, um, it is coupled to density, etc. So what, do, what can I do in terms of gradient? And gradients, uh, you know, we suppose that variations in space and time are slow and long scale, etc. So-called typical fluctuating hydrodynamics, uh, fluctuating hydrodynamics approach, and they wrote down this. Okay, that's up to two gradients in the fields. Is a pressure terms here, anisotropic pressure because everything is anisotropic, <coughs> which depends on density, of course, which couples this to density. That's a crucial thing, coupling the order to the density and the density to the order here. Okay. Uh, in fact, if you if you were to do just this, counting terms allowed by just symmetries with two gradients, you would even write more terms than this, in fact. I don't want to tell you how many, but quite a number more. Uh, if you are educated, you say that that should be enough. And then there is a problem. You already have you know, about a dozen coefficients here. These coefficients are unknown. Not only they are unknown, but they are unknown functions of the local density and even the velocity squared. So you do something by symmetry, but you have to choose 12 parameters. They are sine. So here it's assumed that they are constant, which is not true. Uh, you have to choose their sign, so as to the equation hopefully will be well behaved. And in fact, the coupling to density tells you that you have to consider, at least for some of them, how they depend on local density, which they should for an, an incompressible fluid. So there is no, this is not a way to deal with continuous theories 
even for a simple problem like this, because immediately you have tens, 10 here and maybe more arbitrary numbers to choose, and these numbers are not even numbers, they're functions unknown. Okay, so uh, what we do, and other people do, different approaches, etc., is that we try to derive under assumptions that sort of equations from the microscopic rule. Okay, there are various ways of doing this, take different names. Uh, these systematic approaches are, uh, are, have this main advantage is that you know you can contest or discuss the assumptions that are used and maybe they're not valid and not so well valid or whatever. At the end, you have a systematic procedure at the end of which you're left with equations which look like this, of course, typically have less terms, but each transport coefficient is a function of local density and microscopic parameters. Okay, so you have nothing to, you cannot allow yourself to explore arbitrarily a 12 dimensional parameter space or functional space to say that you know, this or that sort of physics is happening. You have two main microscopic parameters here. Okay, the calculation gives you known functions of these two, function, of these two parameters plus local density. And basically what you have to explore is again a two dimensional parameter space which translates at this level of, uh, you know, you have many functions here, but you don't have to, you don't, you have no choice. This is given by your procedure. Now you can see a posteriori whether what you got here looked at systematically in this parameter space actually reprodu reproduces well or not qualitatively, quantitatively, etc. the microscopic uh, properties that you have uh, studied uh, before by numerics. Okay, that's the way we do it. Other people have done this. I will skip the way we do it. We do typical Boltzmann approach. Uh, so we are going to take the limit of low density and molecular chaos. So the interactions are only binary, etc. For those of you who know these kinetic theory things, uh, <coughs> this should be uh, easy to understand. For those of you who don't know it, the only thing you need to know is that we do some assumptions, we can check their, valid their validity, sometimes they're not very valid. We'll still nevertheless proceed. At the end of the day, we have a systematic procedure. Here, we are helped by the fact that it also worked at the near the onset of order. Okay, I skip all this. The, the lesson is you take a Vickshack like rule, uh, you can write an equation for here, a one body here, a one body uh, probability distribution function. That's the probability of handing a particle at position r, orientation theta, and time t. Okay, this you expand in Fourier modes. At the end of the day, the Fourier modes at order zero are the density, local density field. At order one, are the polarity field, rho p, in fact, momentum field. At order two, it's a local pneumatic tensorial field, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera some scaling on that, which we can discuss, all right? And at the end of the day, for example, for the pneumatic case, you have something like this. You have two coupled PDEs, again, a continuity equation for the density, which you would have written, you know, a diffusion term here, coupled non-trivially to the pneumatic field. That term is crucial in producing uh, the giant number of fluctuations that I talked about. And, and Ginzburg, lambda, you know, F2 minus F2 cube like uh, term here for the uh, pneumatic field uh, equation coupled <coughs> uh, to the density field. All this is a tensorial equation, but we keep a complex notation here in 2D because it's very convenient and diffusion. This is very simple looking. Okay. This has, of course, two homogeneous solutions, the old F2 equals zero and rho equals constant disordered solution, no order, constant density, and another solution with F2 constant, given by just the balance of these two terms. You take homogeneous solutions, you kill this, kill this, kill this, takes this equals zero, this gives you F2 equals, you know, something like uh, square root of mu over xi, in modulus at least, okay two homogeneous solutions. What we can show now is that the homogeneous solution, ordered homogeneous solution, which happens as soon as mu, so mu is a function of local parameters, microscopic parameters, and local density rho. When mu 
is positive, uh, the homogeneous ordered solution exists, as in usual, you know, ginzburg landau kind of thing. Hopf, if you want. <coughs> but uh, this solution is linearly unstable if mu depends on rho, which it does generically for metric models. Anyway, back to what I said before, the homogeneous solution, which normally should appear, in fact, uh, let's take this as the homogeneous, uh, the inhomogeneous phase. Uh, you would say that this is the first, the first uh, line where order appears. In fact, at the liquid gas picture, in fact, it's a line inside the first spin order line. Uh, at this line here, inside, the mu coefficient becomes positive. But instead of usual uh, continuous pitchfork bifurcation giving you the uh, F2 homogeneous solution stable, arbitrarily close to threshold, this solution is in fact linearly unstable because of the dependence of mu on rho. So you have a line here, which is the linear instability of the uh, disordered of the homogeneous solution, uh, in which, so below this line, you have no stable homogeneous solution. You must have inhomogeneous solutions. These inhomogeneous solutions, in fact, uh, you can find Oh yeah, that's because we use complex notations. This is actually, it's a complex gradient, which is dx minus i dy. Yeah, but this is not a Laplacian. This is not a Laplacian. <laughs> this is a, a non-trivial coupling uh, current, non-equilibrium current. That was guessed by clever people like Ramaswamy a long time ago, and now comes up directly from the calculation nicely. With no, you know, a simple coefficient. Everything has been rescaled uh, so that you only, in fact, at the level of continuous level, you only really you are left with only two parameters. In fact, the this is a real Laplacian. The real Laplacian, the real Laplacian is grad grad star, if you want. <laughs> okay. Ah, uh, <laughs> delta squared. No, no, that's not a Laplacian. <laughs> this is so gradient is dx plus i dy. I mean, I have a slide with this. No, no, but here it's three, so it cannot be. It's here. It's not real. F two is a complex field. Ah, okay, okay. F two is a complex field which okay. relates to the, to the you know traceless tensor Q this way. Okay. In two D, it's very very convenient. Believe me, you don't want to work in vectorial tensorial notations here. In 2D, in 3D, you can discuss. Yes? Um, excuse me, it's probably a stupid question. Go ahead. Could you just explain very shortly what the Ginsburg Lando approach is in your case? Ah. <laughs> uh, do you know about amplitude equations, weakly nonlinear analysis, pattern forming systems, Rayleigh Benard convection, that sort of things? Um, it's called Ginsburg Lando because, yeah, depending where you're coming from. It's basically, uh, you can describe. Uh, in this case, you know, let's, let's not go back to this because otherwise I will never finish. But in this case, let me get my equation. Where is it here? Okay, what comes out of the calculation is a linear term F2 and a cubic saturating uh, nonlinear term here with a minus sign, or actually the coefficient psi if you want as a right sign, but it's really saturating. Of course, this is not, this is given by the calculation. So, if I forget, if I take just this, forget about all this, forget about all this, okay, you're left with a very simple uh, ODE, in fact, okay, ordinary differential equation. And uh, you can uh, probably convince yourself that this simple dynamical system with two degrees of freedom here, or maybe one if you take F2 real for now, uh, <coughs> is going to be have a zero, F2 equals zero stable fixed point until mu, as long as mu is negative. If mu, because I vary parameters, becomes positive, the zero fixed point becomes unstable and exchanges stability with a non-zero fixed point, which is given by square root of mu over psi via a pitchfork bifurcation. Are you following me? Yes. Okay. Which have, you know, square root, uh, the amplitude of this fixed point is a square root uh, growth with respect to the bifurcation point here, square root of mu. Um, 
all this, that's what I call Gisborne Landau. So you may call it different or Hopf or whatever. How is it related to the uh, Gisborne Landau Ah, yes. Uh, no, it's not. <laughs> well, you could, no, you can, no, you can, you can use different languages here. Like you can use dynamical systems language, you can use pattern forming weekly nonlinear analysis language, and when we say Ginzburg Landau in this context, uh, we say, ampl we think amplitude equations. People like Vincent certainly knows what I'm talking about. You could indeed also use Ginzburg Landau functionals and, and, uh, you know, some, many of these terms actually derive from some free energy potential, but not all. So just forget about all this. <coughs> so the Ginzburg Landau <coughs> in a loose sense means basically a linear instability saturated by a cubic term in this context at least. Yes? Is mu a real number or a complex number? Mu is over, <coughs> mu is, they're all real. They're all real numbers. So you don't have oscillatory? Uh, no, no, no. Well, not in this. From this starting point, Vic check like things, no way. But uh, who knows? Hmm? Yes. <laughs> so that's not the complex Kinsburg Landau, it's just the Kinsburg Landau. <laughs> Whatever. Okay. I'm not sure what I wanted to say next. Uh, <laughs> so what I want to say, okay, you have these two homogeneous states, so you exchange via this simple Kinsburg Landau mechanism normally the homogeneous zero to the homogeneous ordered state, but in fact this ordered state when now you consider the gradient terms and everything, you do the full linear stability analysis, you see that it is linearly unstable as soon as mu depends on rho in any way. If mu d mu of a zero is non-zero, then the homogeneous ordered state is linearly unstable. So what you see is not the homogeneous ordered solution near threshold. What you see is something else. It cannot be a homogeneous solution because there are none which are stable in this region. What you see is a band. If you do a small system simulation of a PDE, you see a band. But transversely here, you see pneumatic order. Order is in yellow, is zero here, and is finite here, and is zero there. And you have some tanch connections between the two. The density profile is the same, etc. You see this in the computer. If you do simulate your PDE in the region where there are no homogeneous solutions, if you take a box which is not too large. In fact, this solution can be found analytically, and we did this, that's not so hard to do. It looks ugly, but it's actually very simple to do. So we have an explicit form for this non-homogeneous solution. Okay, now, good. We can check that it is indeed the same thing that you see here, fine. But if you are clever enough to be able to do the full linear stability or analysis of the inhomogeneous band solution, then you will discover that this band solution is also unstable. So again, you have two homogeneous solutions. There is a region where none of them is linearly stable. In this region, and actually further away, there exists a nonlinear band solution, which is this thing here. But we were able to prove that this solution is also linearly unstable, always. Always. As soon as it exists, it's linearly unstable. I've finished. Which means that if I take a box larger than this, this solution should break down if I put a little bit of noise. And that's what you see here. Okay, you see here that in fact, in the inhomogeneous uh, region here, and that extends further than the linear stability lines, you have chaos like in a microscopic system. So they, the coexistence phase is chaotic, also in the hydrodynamic description. That's where we're very happy. Okay. Now I have to finish, so I will skip many things. <clears throat> there was the same thing for the Turner 2 equations. You see that my Turner 2 equation has many less terms. And again, all these things are, dis are explicit functions of the parameters and density. We can study uh, its inhomogeneous solutions, which are most of them periodic solutions like this, dominating. Uh, in one minute uh, for Vincent, <coughs> we can show that many of these existing solutions are actually linearly stable also, coexisting. So the selection mechanism is not at the deterministic aerodynamic level. It, it only if, it's only there if you put back uh, fluctuations in the hydrodynamic description. And indeed, if you add noise, to 
this equation is you again come back to what you see microscopically, which is the selection of one of these periodic solutions, well-defined, and only one, whereas many of them coexist and even are stable at the deterministic level. Okay, if you follow, good. If you don't follow, uh, too bad. <coughs> now, summaries. Okay, uh, active matter, collective motion, it's very nice, kinds of things. Even if you do the simplest thing, and you could argue that this is one of the simplest things, local alignment versus noise. You have all these things. Uh, we have now come to a satisfactory picture in terms of this liquid gas picture coupled to order disorder. But still, you know, the fact that uh, these, uh, these giant number fluctuations, these uh, strong correlations in the ordered phases, uh, this selection mechanism by fluctuations of a pattern, all these are really completely new features not to be heard of at, in equilibrium. In fact, <coughs> the, the, the work by Turner and Tu was not just writing down this complicated equation by symmetry arguments. What they did, in fact, the, the bulk of the work is to start from this equation they wrote and study the stability of the, supposing I am in the well-ordered phase, suppose, and I'm studying by RG methods, studying the stability of this ordered phase with respect to fluctuations. In order to prove, and they managed to prove, that indeed you have true long-range order in the polar case, as opposed to the XY model, for the ordered phase. They also, a byproduct of their calculation of this byproduct is not any more very solid for complicated reasons. They also managed to calculate these giant number fluctuation scaling exponents and long-range correlation exponents of, uh, using, uh, using their RG methods, uh, where their predictions, even though they are not very solid theoretically anymore, match the numerics, okay? So we're very happy, the exponent 1.6 that I mentioned and the four thirds, etc. All this comes out of Turner's and Turner and two calculation, the, but there's a big but in, in a sense that their calculation, which is quite remarkable, is not solid anymore and is not supposed to apply to the nematic case. And I skip this, but I'll come back to this now. In the nematic, active nematics case here, here, you see the same n, uh, variance of n, and you see that you have this slope 1.6, actually more or less the same slope as in the polar case. If we follow Turner and 2, this is not supposed to happen. So there is a problem. They got the right answer using an argument which is not general enough because it doesn't apply in this case. And also now we also know that their calculation is under extra assumptions that they cannot justify at all. So there is some of the most remarkable properties like these giant number fluctuations and these long range correlations, which are very generic, observed in all kinds of systems, in fact, experimentally as well, uh, are not, uh, probably not uh, really explained in, in, their, in its old, you know, its generality by the Turner 2 argument. So we need to go back to work, at the theoretical level at least. Um, and uh, that's what is said here, in fact. Uh, and in fact, work at the level of stochastic uh, continuous descriptions is now really needed because first we know that at the deterministic level, you know, the polar things, these bands, etc., etc., there's no selection mechanism done by deterministic hydrodynamic equations, so that's not enough. You know, even though we did all this work to derive these equations and everybody's fighting for the linear stability of this and maybe finding inhomogeneous solutions and all that, this is not enough to explain uh, what you see microscopically. So that's a lesson in, in this is one of the rare cases where uh, deterministic uh, hydrodynamics uh, does not work even for selecting the sh shape of a pattern. And um, in the homogeneous fluctuating phases, the unusual fluctuations, correlations, etc., have no theoretical, solid theoretical understanding, in my opinion, at this point. So they're still at this level, at the theoretical level, lots of things to do. Now, thinking about more complicated situations, you see that it, it is necessary to understand what's going on if, if you have only alignment versus noise, because if you now put some attraction to keep things together in a flock, moving flock, 
or some long range correlations or some inertia or you put back the fluid or whatever, anything else you can do, think of another ingredient in this parameter space here is likely to, to complicate uh, the problem quite a bit. And if you don't understand the basis, the core, uh, you're not in a good shape. And uh, so um, I stop here. Uh, some more questions? <laughs> No, the starlings, if you want to take this, if you want to put them in this phase diagram, you put them somewhere here, very low. There are other flocks of birds that aren't like that densely correlated. Yeah, like there is a current debate about swarms of midges, you know, little things, which are disordered swarms, so they're not moving together. But people argue that they are sufficiently ordered, in fact. Uh, it's not just random walking around some potential well, whatever. And these swarms of midges, they argue from data, are sitting in the transitional zone. Uh, we can discuss the, how convincing this is, but this is a case where you have no orientational order, no collective motion really, but they still do not completely random walk. So selection mechanisms, whatever, puts these groups sitting near the transition, but in the disordered phase slightly so that they can have, you know, large response functions and things like that. So that's one case where of animal group which can be argued to be sitting in the transitional zone. But uh, yeah, there was another question here. So the hydrodynamic equation usually is uh, something like a law of large numbers in a scaling beam? Well, it depends. If you, if you take kind of Fokker Planck, uh, Smolikovsky limit, yes. If you take the Boltzmann way, which, which we do, it's more of a dilute limit in which you have, you know, only binary interactions. The net product is the same equations with the same terms. The explicit expressions for the coefficients, the transport coefficients might differ from the approach you've taken, but basically it's the same equations. Yes, yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Has this been done in no, not, not e no, not even numerically, which is, you know, hard, as you know. At the theoretical level, you know, people doing that sort of thing, they do this on, you know, ASEP, ASEP, you know. That's a, uh, I mean, that, that should be, you know, that should be here, actually. That's actually uh, something we're thinking about, but that, yeah, very hard.